The Legend of Sunset Shimmer, Ocarina of Time By Ganondorf 8 March 13, 2015 Chapter 51, The Strongest Blade I really need to watch where I jump because leaping from such a high place was probably the stupidest mistake I made. It's a good thing that falling in Hyrule doesn't kill you, for this fall would have done just that. Instead, I landed really hard on the pathway below which almost broke my legs from the impact. Bulk Biceps called out wondering if I was okay, but he quickly went back to complaining about his irritating eyes which I thought was rather rude and insensitive. Are you okay? asked Spike. I'm glad that fall damage in this world is so minimal otherwise I'd probably be dead by now, I replied. At least you got back down here in a rather quick fashion. So you need to use that prescription in order to get some eye drops to relieve him of his eyesight problem? I have no doubt that King Zoro will provide us with the ingredient needed to make them, but I know what you're thinking Sunset Shimmer. And yes Zora's domain is still frozen over as that is going to last for some time. The snow has stopped falling since the defeat of Morpha in the water temple, but we still need to traverse the cold terrain. I would recommend switching over to the Goron tunic while there as the warmth it provides should negate the cold before you freeze. Said Spike. Yeah, I'd rather not experience succumbing to being frozen. By the way, do you know what kind of ingredient we need to make the eye drops? Also, how does Bulk Biceps figure that Daring Do of all people has the skills necessary to make them? I asked. I've heard that a certain species of frog is used because its eyes if dissected correctly, it produces the slimy film that's needed to be put into one's own eyes to reduce irritation. Of course. Not just anyone can perform dissection which is why the Zoras merely carry the ingredients as opposed to the medicine itself. Daring Du has been researching how to use the water of Lake Hylia to make medicinal compounds, and combining such aquatic properties with that of something like this special frog is sure to produce what Big Goron needs, replied Spike. It doesn't sound very easy to me, I said. The problem with this frog is that it needs to be delivered fresh otherwise it will lose all of its preservatives, and at that point it would just be a useless specimen meaning we'd have to go all the way back to Zora's domain and try again, said Spike. If there was one thing I didn't want to do, it was being forced to backtrack even more than necessary, so I needed to do this right in one attempt. The idea of having to carry around a frog did make me feel nauseous but I had no other choice if I want to get my hands on that blade. Sighing because of realizing this task was something that I wish could have been a lot more pleasant, I began to make my way back down to Kakariko village. In the meantime, another conversation was taking place which had to do with me, but this one wasn't happening within a realm of darkness, but rather inside of that tent which belonged to Sweetie Belle. Really? You mean to tell me that you met Sunset Shimmer, and didn't invite me to come outside and say hello? Well, she was talking about matters relating to my men having gone and entered the Garudoa's fortress, and that she was going to go there herself to see what they're doing. You could have come outside with me you know, but instead you wanted to stay inside and take a nice long nap because you felt emotionally drained. I travel around this kingdom constantly in order to experience every last facet that exists, so you can't blame me for wanting to take a long rest. You certainly are a strange one given that you go around and sell masks for a living, but don't pay me any mind. That girl appeared as though she hadn't aged a single day in seven years, and I suspect that she could be one of Ganondorf's followers. Now that is such an absurd thing to say Muto. Sunset Shimmer's magic prevented her from aging, but I'm not about to start acting jealous in that she managed to retain her youth. 
As for the idea of her being a servant to the evil king, she has been struggling to free this land from his grip. I know that I sound biased given how she helped me sell my masks to people long ago, but I can assure you she is no follower of that man," said Sonata. She could have gone into the Garudoa's fortress, but instead she decides to go and see Big Goron about getting a broken sword fixed, moans Sweetie Belle. That's because she is looking at the much bigger picture which doesn't revolve around your missing workers Muto. She is aware that the desert is a cursed place where darkness holds an eternal grip over the area, and so she feels that a strong weapon is going to help her make it through to the other side whereupon is located that mysterious temple," said Sonata. I guess I'll hold my judgment until my men have returned, said Sweetie Belle. To be honest with you, they chose a really bad time to want to become thieves. There are rumors going around that the Garudo have been experiencing some personnel issues what with some acting out against the will of their king, and I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of whatever kind of punishment they may get. Anyone who is suspected of showing defiance is either executed on the spot, or banished from the tribe and forced to live in the desert," said Sonata. It doesn't sound that bad, being exiled that is, said Sweetie Belle. Don't you remember what happened to the old second-in-command? asked Sonata. She was kicked out of the tribe for betraying Ganondorf, and she disappeared soon after entering the haunted wasteland, replied Sweetie Belle. And that disappearance strikes as being odd, began Sonata. What do you mean? asked Sweetie Belle. Many who wind up entering that desert often come back to the fortress without even realizing it, and are forced to go back into the dark sands until they either succumb to it, or make it to the other side which rarely happens. That former commander was more than capable of surviving out there, and yet she vanished without a trace," replied Sonata. I guess you do make a valid point, for she could survive in that infernal wasteland better than most of her fellow thieves. Speaking of rumors, there is another one that has been circling around that involves someone living in the desert using brainwashing. Some claim that Neburu, the former second-in-command merely pretended to be missing, and in truth has been responsible for manipulating minds. Others say that this is the work of a powerful witch who is said to have raised Ganondorf, but whichever of these two stories happens to be true, it shows you that this area of Hyrule is just as corrupted in darkness like the other areas, said Sweetie Belle. Wouldn't it have been important to have told Sunset Shimmer about that rumor? asked Sonata. Again, I'll hold my judgment until I know what has become of my men replied Sweetie Belle. Despite being stubborn Muto, you sure know how to stay true to your convictions, said Sonata. If you didn't happen to be a friend of that woman, I would have kicked you out for that insult, but then I suppose you do have a good point about me. By the way, whatever happened to her anyway? asked Sweetie Belle. She's been spending these past days just running around this side of the bridge because she can't go into the Garudoa's fortress, and she has no way to go back across to Hyrule Field where she wishes to resume her marathon event that she started about a year ago. I'm actually hoping that Sunset Shimmer can bring your workers here in order for all of you to repair the bridge, for I wish for the route to become open once again. As it currently remains right now, it will just cause nothing but misery, yet I do have a means of making you happy until things naturally get better for you. Why don't I show you my collection of masks for surely there is one among them which will appeal to you enough to want to purchase it?" suggested Sonata. After having Ipo na gallop briefly across the short distance from the entrance of Kakariko village to the start of the path which leads into Zora's river, I had to get down from her almost instantly which made her feel rather upset. 
I made sure to nay to her to assure that I would be back as quickly as possible given that all I had to do was get a frog rather than explore another dungeon. Epona doesn't want me to leave her behind, I said. There are no monsters that will attack her because they only show up in specific locations, said Spike. I know. But still she wishes that she could come along with us to Zora's domain, even though that is not possible, I said. Many places exist in Hyrule where horses cannot tread, and while it's inconvenient to them, there isn't much that anyone can do about it. Besides, you'll be back here in about twenty minutes as all we need to do is speak to King Zora and get that frog. It's not like he's going to ask us to go into a dungeon as a means of proving your worth. As long as you explain the situation to him, I'm sure he will understand what must be done. Said Spike. There's something else I need to tell him, I began. What's that? Asked Spike. His daughter isn't going to be coming back home to him anytime soon. Right now, he probably believes that Rarity has accomplished her task in the Water Temple, and is slowly taking her time returning because of wanting to see what else may have befallen the kingdom. I know that he is going to be heartbroken when I reveal that Destiny has chosen her to protect the world as one of the Six Sages, but he needs to understand that she is doing her part to banish Ganondorf when the time comes. I'm going to have to prepare for the worst in case he decides to punish me or something. I replied. Then maybe you should tell him after you get the frog, suggested Spike. No, that would be dishonest, I said. That's what I hoped you would say, smiled Spike. Deep down, I was rather afraid of what might happen if Hondo Flanks, aka Rarity's father, a.k.a. King Zora should he decide to have me executed, or imprisoned, but I had no choice but to tell him because he deserved to know what became of her. When Fluttershy didn't return to the Kokiri Forest, I told Diamond Tyera what happened despite a small inkling in my heart telling me not to say anything. Walking along Zora's river was rather peaceful for the number of Octo Rocks had definitely reduced in number since my previous visit this way, yet there were still a couple of them popping out of the water which I defeated by bouncing their rocks back at them. That's when I came across the magic bean which I planted seven years ago. I wonder why we never noticed this before? I asked. You did plant one of those beans in the soft soil when we originally came back from Zora's domain, replied Spike. I guess that I completely forgot all about it, and could have used it to help us out. You don't need to say that you told me so as I don't regret buying those magic beans because they possessed a powerful magic inside. I said. Perhaps now we can use this one in order to see what it can do suggested Spike. We should otherwise I'll never know if what Snips said to me was indeed accurate, I said. Stepping onto the magic bean did nothing at first, and in my head I could hear the mocking laughter coming from Spike, but all of a sudden it started to rise into the air before zooming off at quite a ridiculous speed. The plant made its way through much of the area allowing me to avoid the octorocks and tektites before coming to a stop at the wooden bridge which leads to the waterfall. As I stepped off, the plant rose into the air again before zooming in the other direction most likely returning to its place of origin. So that's what those beans do? Ha! Huh. I think you owe me an apology for having purchased something which proved to be useful. I'll admit that I was wrong about your purchase, but I can still say that you should have planted more of them, said Spike. Okay, I can give you that because I've only planted about three, and I have seven more left. I need to be reminded to go ahead and plant them the next time we go back into the past because we both know that is going to happen. I said. A shame that you can't use the plant to go back unless you choose to stay on it, 
said Spike. That's what the water current is for as we'll use it to come back quickly, I said. Continuing on the path to Zora's domain before coming to a stop in front of the waterfall, I stepped onto the Triforce symbol and took out the Ocarina of Time from my belt, and played Twilight's lullaby which caused the water to weaken. I jumped across to the other side of the gap, and entered the frozen wasteland. Despite it no longer snowing like it was before, the sudden decrease in temperature made me feel very uneasy, and so I needed to change over to the Goron tunic for a while to prevent myself from succumbing. I did ask Spike to turn around while I changed as I didn't want him to see my naked body, and once I finished changing, I made my way up to the throne room where Hondo Flanks was still sitting. Welcome to Zora's Domain, said Hondo Flanks. It's been a while since my last visit your majesty, I said. Oh. So you've come back once again Sunset Shimmer? I hope that the Zora tunic has proven useful. While I see you are wearing the tunic made by the Gorons, I can understand that you wish to keep as warm as possible. My body has long since gotten used to these conditions, so it doesn't affect me at all. Anyway, what brings you here before me this time? Asked Hondo Flanks. I'm sure you're aware that the snow has stopped falling. I asked. Yes, it's a sign that the water temple has returned to normal and therefore my people shall one day become free of the icy prison which traps them. I have no doubt in my mind that you were able to aid Princess Ruto in destroying the evil which plagued our most sacred ground, and for that you have proven yourself to be a noble heroine in the name of the Zoras. However, I have noticed that my daughter is not with you, so am I to assume that she decided to take some time to explore the other regions? Hyrule has many different ecosystems which she has never witnessed before due to living a rather sheltered life, but I suppose that she is now old enough to be able to visit these places without me needing to hold her hand. Replied Hondo Flanks. About that, I began. Is there something that you wish to say? Asked Hondo Flanks. Your daughter, Princess Ruto did perform her duty in destroying the curse, but destiny had a different plan where the sacred realm called out to her. She has been chosen to become the Sage of Water whose duty is to guard the temple, and because of that she can never return to Hyrule for she must remain in the chamber of the sages. I know that you've been awaiting anxiously for her to return home, but she won't be coming back no matter how hard you plea. I replied. My daughter isn't coming home. Asked Hondo Flanks. I could tell with the stutter in his voice that he was having trouble taking it all in, and my heart made me feel like he was going to punish me. It took him a few minutes of thinking, but Hondo Flanks finally came to a decision which I feared. I had a feeling this was to be the case, for Princess Ruto did reveal to me some years ago that a great destiny awaited her. Was I seriously hearing this? Am I to believe that he was aware that she wasn't coming back, yet still yearned for her safe return? I guess that makes sense given he is a worried parent and all, but he could have handled this a lot differently. My daughter informed me of her destiny through a dream she had before the snow started to fall, so you could say that I was prepared for this day to come. Then what will you do? I asked. Nothing, for what has become of my daughter is beyond my reach. I know that she is in a much better place where her power can be used to bring peace back to this world, yet I am thankful to you for having come and told me anyway. While my heart weeps for her to come home, I shall accept what has come to pass with a strong mind. Sunset Shimmer you have performed your duty expected of the one destined to save this troubled land, and for that you deserve to be rewarded. Whatever you desire from me, name it and it shall become yours. Replied Hondo Flanks. 
I do have one thing I need, I began. What is that? asked Hondo Flanks. I'm in need of a special frog, I replied. You desire something like that as a reward? I must admit that I am confused by such an odd request, said Hondo Flanks. Maybe if I give this to you, it will make a lot more sense, I said. I walked around the edge of his throne room until I was standing next to him, and then I reached into my pocket and took out the prescription which Bulk Biceps handed over to me. It was a relief knowing it was still there despite falling from a great height, galloping along on horseback, and using a magic bean to skip over a section of Zora's river. Once I gave it to Hondo Flanks, I walked back to the raised platform which is used to hear what he has to say, and he started to look over it. This is something Big Goron needs for his eyesight has gotten poor due to the eruption of Death Mountain a few days ago. I do not have the ingredient which you require, said Hondo Flanks. Then how am I supposed to get the eye drops? I asked. No need to show disappointment, for I do possess the frog which you need. However, I must warn you that this frog can only survive in a cold temperature. If it is exposed too long to a warm climate, then it will spoil and nothing can be salvaged from it. Take this to the laboratory located in Lake Hylia, and give it to the woman who lives there. You have about an hour to get there before this eyeball frog spoils replied Hondo Flanks. Did you just seriously call it that? I asked. Yes, for that is the name of this particular species of frog, replied Hondo Flanks. An hour isn't all that long, I said. You are young and full of energy, so I have no doubt that you can make it in time. Of course, if you were to ride a horse down to the lake, you should be able to make it with plenty of time to spare," said Hondo Flanks. He then handed over the eyeball frog by tossing it to me, and when I grabbed it, I felt really sick because of how slimy it fell to the touch, but I placed it into one of my spare pouches which I would need to throw away. Thanking him for the frog. I turned around and began to head back to the river in order to get to Ipona quickly. Should you not make it in time, you can come back here, and I will give you another one for you to take no matter how many attempts you acquire. Those final words from Hondo Flanks weren't the most encouraging ones. I intend on getting this done right on the first try, so when I got back outside into Zora's river, I jumped into the water whose current began to push me down the river in a quick fashion. That was quite intense, I said. But you did acquire the eyeball frog, added Spike. I can't believe how slimy the thing was given that we needed to make eye drops, I moaned. Sounds to me that you feel squeamish when it comes to that kind of thing, said Spike. Not really just because of one little moment of weakness, but I can't seem to hide any secrets from you, I said. After being around you for as long as I have, I've come to know your mannerisms and way of thinking. Don't think of my words as being insulting to your character, but rather it should be a blessing that I appreciate who you are, said Spike. It also helps that I've been saying a lot about my history, I said. Talking about such things can help you to overcome them, and make you become stronger in the process. If you have anything on your mind that you wish to talk about, know that I am right here ready to listen to what you have to say. Anyway, I hope that Ipona will be able to gallop down to Lake Hylia within the time limit otherwise we'll have to go back and see King Zora about getting another frog. That will cause us to waste even more time which we have little to spare because of needing to go to the Garudoa's fortress and find out what happened to those carpenters, said Spike. I have the utmost faith in her speed, I smiled. 
it didn't take long to make my way down to the mouth of Zora's river, and I checked on the eyeball frog to make sure that it was okay. To my relief, it was still intact although I couldn't take a breather as I need to keep going if I'm to deliver this on time. Ipona was very happy to see me return much sooner than expected, so I climbed onto her saddle giving her a soft kick to the ribs upon which she began galloping off at a fast speed. Okay girl, we must reach Lake Hylia in about 55 minutes to deliver this thing I'm carrying in my pouch. Do you think you can make it there in that amount of time? The loud neigh which came from Ipona was an indication that she was determined to live up to my expectations, and that's when she galloped even faster than before. Guess you were right about her speed, said Spike. All she needed was the chance to prove herself, I said. We should arrive at the laboratory long before the time limit runs out if she keeps up this pace, said Spike. That was my hope as well although I had no idea if she was going to be able to take me back to Kakariko village as going this fast was bound to exhaust her. She was able to get me to Lake Hylia within about 52 minutes leaving me with 3 minutes left, but she did look exhausted from the journey. Daring Du was outside with her equipment and appeared to be continuing with her water experiments. When she heard the clip-clopping of hooves, she turned around to notice me and immediately came up to me leaving what she was working on behind. I'm not sure if that was a good idea given how precious that equipment must be. Sunset Shimmer? What are you doing back here? Asked Daring Du. I came here to see you about something really important, I replied. Does it have anything to do with that mask? I've put that project on hold as I really want to get this water project finished. Ever since you restored the lake back to normal, I've been taking several samples to see what kind of properties exist, and still there have been no good results. It's reaching the point where it's making me feel really frustrated but I shouldn't be taking it out on you," said Daring Do. I have this eyeball frog, I began. That is a very rare creature which is native only to Zora's domain. In fact, I haven't seen any since the snow and ice froze that region over, but why would you have something like that on your person? I figured you would be the sort of person who carries about things that can be useful to you said Daring Do. I then explained the situation as quickly as I could given that the frog was about a minute away from spoiling. If that's the case, then we better go inside. Entering her home once again, it was even more of a mess than ever what with all of the books scattered here and there. When you said that you had an eyeball frog with you, all of these ideas were flowing in my mind of how I could use various parts of it in order to carry out some of my research experiments, but since this is a specific request you asked of me, I've no choice but to go with the one idea. I'm sorry if I've stifled your creativity, I said. Not at all. In fact, I was hoping someone would come along with what you brought as now I can finally determine the properties of Lake Hylia's water. You see, I was taking different samples of water and combining them with typical compounds, but the results as I said have been no good. Since an eyeball frog is an unusual compound, I should be able to create what you need," said Daring Do. How does it work? I asked. Luckily, you brought this frog before it could spoil, so I'm able to use what is considered the most important part. The eyes. The rest of the frog is essentially useless, but the eyes are what contain the properties needed to create big Goron's eye drops. Now, do you happen to be squeamish? Asked Daring Do. I suppose so, I answered. Then I suggest that you look away for the next little while as I am going to be busy dissecting this little guy. I know that it sounds rather cruel, but this type of frog is one of the kinds that are used for various medicines. 
King Zora certainly knows how to keep them fresh as this is perhaps the freshest one I've seen in years," said Daring Do. You didn't answer my question, I said. Sorry about that. Whenever something like this happens, I have a tendency to forget about other people being in the vicinity, and instead focus on seeing what I can use from the specimen. Once I have cut the eyeballs from the frog, I'll be mixing the compound with some of the water from the lake. This will be followed by using some of my equipment to warm up the mixture until it has reached the right temperature. Finally, I'll be able to take the compound and adjust it accordingly until I have produced the resulting eye drops. By my calculation, this will take me a few minutes," said Daring Do. That quickly? I asked. This isn't my first time trying to combine compounds with the lake's water, for I've been doing this for the last 20 years now. Because you want eye drops, it's a simple procedure which doesn't need all that much in the way of complex maneuvers, but I'll aim to make you the best eye drops Hyrule has ever seen," replied Daring Do. She certainly was feeling confident about her skills, so I knew that this was going to work out in the end but I quickly had to avert my gaze for she was starting to cut out the eyes. Hearing the squishing sounds made me want to throw up, and I couldn't even begin to imagine how she was feeling. After having to endure two minutes worth of squishing, she moved on to the next phase where the rest of the procedure hardly took any time. Well, I've finally created the eye drops for you Sunset Shimmer, and I must say that they are without a doubt the best product I've created. What about the rest of the frog? I asked. No point letting it go to waste now, so I'll probably cook what's left for dinner tonight, replied Daring Do. I wish that I hadn't asked that question, but then she handed over a rather precious looking bottle containing some kind of blue liquid. You must take that bottle to Big Goron so that he can apply them to his eyes, but I must warn you that these eye drops don't have any preservatives. Meaning? I asked. At this current temperature, they won't last long, so unless you can deliver them to him in time, the eye drops will be completely useless, and you'll have to go all the way back to see King Zora about getting another eyeball frog. I'd say you have about 90 minutes before they spoil, but you should make it if you ride your horse quickly," replied Daring Do. Just when it looked like I was completely done with all of these races against time, I end up having to experience another one, and this one had a lot of consequences for me to endure should I fail. Having Ipo na gallop back to Kakariko village would push her to the limit given how she gave it her all to make it here in time so maybe I should use one of Sheik's warp songs in order to get there in an instant. Anything else I need to know? I asked. Using magic of any kind while carrying around the eye drops will cause them to spoil immediately, replied Daring Do. Are you serious? I asked. Relying on such ancient arts will end up corrupting the mixture, replied Daring Do. Well, there goes that idea as warping is a form of magic, and if I were to say go from here to the Death Mountain Crater, it will ruin everything and I'll have to go back to Zora's domain and start this process from the beginning. No, I'd rather not do that again, so I need to accomplish this task in one attempt. Thanking her for everything that she has done, I took my leave of her home and walked over to Ipo Na who appeared to be confused over what I was about to ask of her. Ipo Na, I need you to gallop as fast as you can once again because I need to deliver these eye drops before they are ruined. All I am asking of you is to get me to the village quickly, and from there I'll take care of the rest. I know that you're exhausted from galloping from Zora's river all the way down here to Lake Hylia, but I really have need of you now more than ever. I probably sound really cruel forcing you to do something which can potentially cause you great harm, 
so maybe I'll just go there on foot although it would mean having to run without stopping which is bound to give me a heart attack or something, I said. Epona in response stumped her hooves into the ground before giving me a series of aggressive neighs where she told me that she was determined to carry out my wishes no matter what the cost would be. I then petted her on the muzzle followed by hugging her where tears trickled down my eyes. Thank you girl, and I am sorry for thinking that you can't handle such intense situations. Climbing onto her saddle and giving her a soft kick to the ribs, Epona began to gallop off at a fast speed because she knew what was at stake. There was something else happening in Gerudo Valley at that exact moment, and I had no idea what it was going to mean for me. So you finally decided to come back to the tent? Running around this same stretch of land ends up getting boring after a while. I don't blame you for feeling miserable because you want to be running around in Hyrule Field, but I can't do nothing until the bridge is fixed, and I need my men back here to do exactly that. I'm terribly sorry that this has been such an inconvenience for you running woman, yet all you can do for the time being is just wait here and see what happens in the coming hours. You should go in there and get them out, suggested Arya. I'm a carpenter, not a warrior. If I tried to do something like that, the Garudo will capture me and lock me up somewhere. They only do that kind of thing to men because of a pathological disliking towards them. Since you're a woman like I am, you can go about their fortress and be treated with so much dignity it was as though you were some kind of queen. Said Arya. No. I'll likely get thrown into one of their prisons because my workers are men. I don't why those idiots wanted to become thieves in the first place when they knew full well that their gender would get them in trouble, but I suppose that I insulted them far too often which resulted in them leaving. I know that I've been giving them a hard time, but it's just that I want them to become the best. Then how do you plan on getting them back Muto? Asked Arya. Someone else is going to be helping me with that, replied Sweetie Belle. Now, who would be crazy enough to venture into the Garudoa's fortress, especially considering how dangerous that place has gotten in recent days? They're acting like they are preparing for the arrival of someone specific, said Arya. There was a girl who came earlier while jumping over the gap using a horse, and she said that she was going into the fortress because she needed to reach the desert. I asked her if she could check on my men to see what they were doing, and she agreed to my request. I believe her name was Sunset Shimmer. Yes, that's who it was as I remember speaking to her years ago, said Sweetie Belle. I remember her because she sold me that bunny hood which encouraged me to embrace my inner rabbit said Arya. You still have that thing? asked Sweetie Belle. Of course as it's become a part of who I am, and I would never part with it for anything. I don't wear it anymore because I've gotten older, but I keep it at home where it's safely inside a special box which will preserve it for years to come. I recall she disappeared before Ganondorf attacked Hyrule Castle, so it's weird that she has returned after being gone for so long. If she intends on entering the Garudoa's fortress, she is going to need someone who knows their way around. Replied Arya. And that would be you? Asked Sweetie Belle. I've come in and out of the fortress for a few years now because they view me as an honorary member of the tribe, replied Arya. I know that you aren't a warrior either running woman, so while your intentions are noble, you are likely to be captured if they believe you to be acting against their interests. That second in command is really loyal to Ganondorf, and that makes her a very dangerous woman, said Sweetie Belle. Then what do you suggest? asked Arya. 
Maybe you can give her some advice before she enters as she is going to need all the help she can get, replied Sweetie Belle. Guess I'll just go inside and wait for her to show up. By the way, I take it Sonata has been showing you some of her masks, and you ended up buying one of them from her? You don't need to say a word Muto because I can see it behind your back, said Arya. By the time Ipo now made it to Kakariko village, I had about 15 minutes left, so I climbed down, and neighed to indicate that I would be back in a short while. Making my way through the village, I did notice that repairs were already underway to fix things because of the fire which ravaged everything. I was surprised that none of them could hear the bellowing of bulk biceps, and I was actually curious as to the reason behind it. How do you suppose no one can hear the sounds of someone calling for help? I asked. I have to admit that is really odd given that Big Goron's voice is so loud that it can be heard not only on Death Mountain, but also Kakariko Village, Zora's River, Zora's Domain, and even the likes of Lon Lon Ranch, replied Spike. While I can understand that the villagers need to focus on repairs, they could have at least sent someone to find out what all the noise is about. Of course, there is no noise to be heard which is weird, but maybe it has something to do with the dark power which has pervaded the land? I asked. It's best not to think about it Sunset Shimmer given that we need to make our way up to Big Goron, replied Spike. Yes, we had to hurry as I didn't want to start this lengthy process all over again. The instant I arrived in the area via the Death Mountain Trail, I almost fell over due to the booming voice of bulk biceps bellowing out across the mountain. What was scary at this precise moment was that I nearly dropped the vial containing the drops, and if it had broke then I'd really be up the creek as it were, but I was fast enough to catch it before it shattered on the ground. It's been a few hours now since she left, and despite having repeated my concern many times over, I'm still holding out hope that she will be able to return here in time before my eyesight becomes so bad that I am forced to close down my business forever, said Bulk Biceps. Patience isn't his strongest suit, I said. You can't blame him for wanting to get those drops as his pain must be unbearable by now, said Spike. But I can for yelling so loud that he almost destroyed that which he needs, I moaned. I needed to get to him quickly, but his booming voice is going to be a problem I have to work around if I am to make it. The pathway leading up the mountain didn't have magma rocks coming down from the mouth of the volcano, and the lack of monsters up until the wall I have to climb was another insurance of being able to get to my destination in time before it was too late. Oh. I can feel my vision slowly fading away. Said Bulk Biceps. Once again, he is being very melodramatic, I moaned. Can you blame him? Asked Spike. Not really as he has been waiting patiently for me to return, but I am surprised that the Gorons haven't complained about him, I replied. I must admit that it's unusual that they haven't tried to communicate with him in the hopes of getting him to calm down, but since none of them can even reach his location given how they are afraid of heights, their voices most likely won't even reach his ears, said Spike. Maybe he should move further down the mountain so that the other Gorons can get to him, I suggested. His current location is the only area that's big enough to accommodate his rather large size, said Spike. No wonder because he's often lonely up there, I said. It's hard not to feel bad about bulk biceps because he probably didn't want to be as big as he is, and for that he can't get certain things he needs due to being too big to even leave Death Mountain. Despite the fact that his belly aching was giving me problems of my own, I was determined to get up there and deliver the eye drops. Running along the pathway was easy because he was surprisingly quiet, but as I reached the wall, 
the Skull Wallatulas had returned, and that meant eliminating them before making my way up. Taking out the fairy bow, I fired arrows at all of the ones I could hit from my current position, yet once again the last one was beyond my reach, so I had to climb to the ledge jutting from the side of the cliff like last time. I can hear the sounds of someone firing a weapon, said Bulk Biceps. I'll be with you in just a few moments, I said. That is the voice of the one who spoke to me before, and said they would go and get the eye drops that I need. I'm so relieved that you have returned after what feels like forever, said Bulk Biceps. It's only been several hours at the most, I moaned. You can't blame me for feeling that way because of how my eyes are so irritated, said Bulk Biceps. No, I suppose not, I said. I have no doubt in my mind that you have brought back what I need, so I shall wait here for you to come up to this location so that we can finish our business, said Bulk Biceps. You know. He could have simply reached forward with his hand and just picked me up making things a whole lot easier, but with his eyesight being what it is right now, he's more likely to swat me into the abyss or something. Destroying the remaining Skull Wallatula, I finished my climb until I was standing before him once again, and I was surprised that he wasn't rubbing his eyes. Your footsteps just now indicate that you have reached me and I am so happy about it that I have tears coming from my eyes. Granted, I can't rub them because of my irritation, but you obviously know what I mean. Were you able to give King Zora the prescription? Did he give you the ingredient needed so that the woman in Lake Hylia could create the eye drops? Have you brought them for me? To be honest, I wasn't expecting to be given two races against time in order to do this for you, I said. My apologies for having given you any stress, for while I was aware that the ingredient could easily spoil, I had no idea that the eye drops themselves were in the same boat. I know you must be feeling exhausted, but if you would be so kind as to give me the drops, I can put them to good use and relieve you of the stress you must be experiencing, said Bulk Biceps. I asked him at that moment to move forward and reach out with his hand so that he could take the vial from me, but I told him to be extremely careful because it was fragile. He followed my instructions perfectly, and when his palm was before me, I placed the eye drops in his hand, and he raised it above his head where he proceeded to administer the drops. The sound of two drops could be heard all across Death Mountain, and it was both a disturbing and relieving experience for me. Wow! These eye drops are working great. At last, my vision has come back to me after so long, and for that I can resume my work. I must thank you for having gone and done all of this for me, and I know just what I can do to make you very happy. What would that be? I asked. First, I need you to take this claims check which is proof that you have requested me to either make you a weapon from scratch, or you wanted me to repair one of my weapons. In this case, it is the latter option which you have chosen. I know that you are most likely confused right now, but do know that this is how I do my business with all of my customers. Replied Bulk Biceps. He moved forward and reached out with his hand where he gave me a small stone slab which had a sword etched into it. According to what the check said, I was guaranteed one of his weapons the moment I show this to him when the time comes. Normally, it would take me several days to repair a weapon, but because you went to a great deal of trouble to help me out, I am going to work extra hard and repair this blade within a matter of hours. So how do you go about making a weapon? I asked. Hylian carpenters come all the way up here to request me to make or repair something for them, and it takes me some time because of my inconsistency. It's impossible for me to go and collect the necessary materials, 
so Hylians bring me the supplies I need which is about twice a month. From there, I use my dexterity to make what has been requested, and upon finishing my work, the customers are happy despite having to wait. It does depend at times on how my mood is which can determine how long I can take, but overall my weapons can never break for I use technic quests that I cannot say. Replied Bulk Biceps. I was told that you are rather secretive about your skills, I said. Then you have heard correctly, said Bulk Biceps. I should really let you get on with your work if you plan on repairing that broken tool by tonight, so I'm going to see if I can get a few hours of sleep because I am going to be needing it where I'm going, I said. My work shouldn't be too loud for you, said Bulk Biceps. Considering how loud he is, the thought of hearing the sounds of his work filled me with dread, and I fear that I won't be getting as much sleep as I would like. What ended up surprising me was just how quiet he was, and this was perhaps one of the biggest contradictions I've ever experienced where someone so loud could work without making a single peep. In fact, I slept so well that not even a brief moment of him banging metal was enough to wake me up. By the time night came around, I woke up and saw that Bulk Biceps was looking up at the night sky. There was some sweat dripping from his brow so he must have worked really hard just to finish this repair on time. When he noticed that I was awake, he turned his attention towards me before speaking out loud. Now is the time for you to use that claims check I gave you in order to receive your sword. I must admit that this is my finest work yet, and you will be very pleased with the result. Here's the check as you presented to me. I said as I showed it to him. He then moved forward once more, and reached out with his hand where he gently placed on the ground a rather beautiful looking sword complete with its own scabbard. I had never seen anything as amazing as this in my entire life, and for that he has certainly proved to me that he is a master at his profession. I picked it up, and swung it about a few times while holding it in both hands because of the size of the blade. It just felt so right in my hands which made me very happy indeed. This is the big Goron's sword named after myself, and unlike the giant's knife made by my brother, what you hold in your hands will never break no matter how much punishment you choose to give to it. That blade is without a doubt the strongest weapon in the kingdom, for even the legendary master sword cannot compare. If you would be so kind as to leave behind the giant's knife, I will make certain to guide my brother into forging more durable blades in the future. I will make sure that your name and presence are not mentioned in case you wish to be anonymous. Finally, I would like you to keep the claims check as a souvenir because you can look at it, and remind yourself that you help someone in need, said Bulk Biceps. I guess this is goodbye then, I said. Before you go, may I have the pleasure of your name? Asked Bulk Biceps. Of course, seeing as I know who you are. My name is Sunset Shimmer, I replied. That is such a beautiful name for someone who is so beautiful that the very sun basks in your radiance. I shall never forget what you have done, Sunset Shimmer, and I wish you luck for the future. Said Bulk Biceps. I thanked him for repairing the weapon Sweetie Belle gave to me, yet I was curious as to how he was going to explain things to Medigorin when he is in Goron City deep within the recesses of a cave. It was a question that I didn't need an answer to because it was probably beyond my means of understanding but once I placed the giant's knife on the ground, and added this new blade to my collection by placing it next to the master sword's scabbard, I proceeded to head back down the mountain using the vines on the wall instead of jumping off. It's been a few hours now, and she still hasn't come back yet. You need to remain calm because you of all people know how long it takes Big Goron to repair a weapon. 
I'd say that she won't be coming back here for a few days at the very least, so it looks like you'll be continuing to mope about for a while. Sigh. I should never have given her that broken tool in exchange for my poacher's saw. Instead, I should have insisted on having her ask for a better reward, and she would be in the Garudoa's fortress right now trying to find my men. Guess I was being too soft for my own good, and I'm not known for being like that. If she doesn't show up soon, I don't know what else I can do. You could have gone in and found out for yourself. I know that I shouldn't be relying on someone else to get the job done, but I don't want to go in there knowing that those Garudo are waiting for an excuse to capture anyone. That Sunset Shimmer does have a lot of courage for being such a young girl, yet she obviously doesn't realize what she is going up against. I believe you're wrong about her Muto. What makes you say that? asked Sweetie Belle. She is more powerful than appearances suggest, and she's seen things that you and I will never experience in our lifetimes. I have no doubt that she has what it takes, but she is going to need to be cunning to able to sneak past all of the guards. They have increased their security in recent months for reasons not even I know, for I tried asking them a few times, and I received no answer. Might have to do with that girl, suggested Sweetie Belle. Because she is one of those heroic types, she won't be killing any of them as they're not monsters, so she is probably going to have to stun them in order to get by. They may not look like it, but the Garudo aren't what you would call durable as their training focuses on speed and power rather than defense. Even the most inexperienced soldier can easily overcome one of them if they were to take advantage of their lack of defensive maneuvers. Surely they have the means of getting around that running woman? Asked Sweetie Belle. They've got a few specific moves designed to counterbalance their poor defenses, replied Arya. I knew it. They pretty much have an answer to everything. Moan Sweetie Belle. Not necessarily so Muto. I've had a first-hand look at their training sessions, and one thing does seem to be a consistent issue. They have a really hard time dealing with magic because they are skilled at close quarters combat, so if Sunset Shimmer happens to be a skilled magician, I have no doubt that she will be just fine. Said Arya. I did suggest she should just go back home but she was insistent on getting through to the desert, and when you have such a stubborn streak in you, nothing anyone says is going to stop them. Yawn. It's really late now, and I doubt that girl would be crazy to attempt to sneak into the fortress at night. Said Sweetie Belle. Yeah, I'm getting tired as well, and I agree that it would be nothing short of crazy. I guess I'll speak to her when she comes by in the morning and warn her about what she's going to encounter. I'm surprised Sonata didn't want to come out here and talk with us, but I guess all of that mask business earlier made her want to sleep almost instantly. Or it could be that strange food she ate a while ago. A taco is what she called it, said Arya. By the time I finally made it back to Garudo Valley, the night was still young as the moon hadn't reached the highest point of its apex. Having her jump over the gap that used to house the bridge was now a necessity because she refused to be left behind, but this time I actually wanted to see the leap across because something compelled me to want to see it for myself. When Ipo Na made the leap, it felt like I was a pegasus for that brief moment, or rather an alicorn because of my magic and when she reached the other side, she galloped slowly until she came to a stop. It looks like everyone has gone to sleep for the night, I said. I'm guessing that Muto had additional guests living in that tent aside from the other carpenters, said Spike. Judging from the shadows I can see by looking through the flaps, there appear to be three of them with one obviously belonging to her. 
Do you suppose the Garudo are asleep right now? I asked. Hard to say for sure, but if I were to wager a guess, they have guards designated to patrolling the fortress during the day, and others to patrol it during the night. This isn't going to be easy as we won't know where the guards will be situated until we literally are on top of them. Also, I suggest that you don't bring Epona because we don't want them to take her away. Replied Spike. It'd be nice if we had some idea of what we're up against, I said. Among the tribes of Hyrule, the Garudo are the most mysterious as there is very little about them in the history books. This is because they have been so reclusive over the generations that there are historians who are dedicated to understanding how they operate as a society. Most of them never made it back, and instead were forced to rot away in the dungeons of the fortress, were exiled to the desert where they succumbed, or somehow escaped and vowed to never return for as long as they lived. The king had hoped that with an alliance, the Garudo would finally begin to open up to the rest of the kingdom, but Ganondorf made sure nothing of his people would become known to those who were deemed outsiders, said Spike. Surely there are some people beyond the tribe who are recognized, I suggested. Individuals like that do exist although they are few in number. They are known as honorary members of the tribe who have access to the various facilities located within the fortress, and they are allowed to come and go as they please. However, any information is strictly forbidden to outsiders, so there's no point in trying to ask someone like that as they would have nothing to say," said Spike. Guess our only course of action is to go in, and see for ourselves just what the Garudoa's fortress is like. I said. Epona then began to trot along as I didn't want to wake anyone sleeping inside of the tent, and she made her way over to a small group of boulders before coming to a stop where I climbed down from her saddle. She began to neigh softly which was her telling me she wished that I turn back, but I neighed in response telling her that this had to be done for the future of Hyrule. After a few exchanges of nothing but long and short neighs, I patted Epona on the nose and rubbed her muzzle before walking off towards the fortress. The cliffs were pretty large when I entered the area, and I could understand why this was a really effective means for the Garudo to pick off any potential enemies. With how this pathway is set up, they can easily stand on top of one of these cliffs, and use ranged attacks in order to defeat intruders. They in turn would be unable to do anything as they wouldn't be expecting such an attack. They are known for using devious methods to overcome their enemies, said Spike. From what you and Sheik have told me, it's best not to underestimate them because of how good their combat skills are, I said. Most of the Garudo around here are mere guards whose job it is to protect the territory while the rest venture forth into Hyrule Field and beyond. It's those thieves who you need to be careful of as they possess the most skill among the tribe, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of their warriors have been tasked to make sure that the carpenters don't try anything," said Spike. You think they've been captured? I asked. Most likely given how the thieves have an immense hatred of men, replied Spike. This made the situation a lot more difficult as it was my belief that they were all in one location where all I had to do was convince them to come back to Sweetie Bell. If they were imprisoned, then the most logical course of action was to have them all locked up in different areas so as to prevent anyone from rescuing them. Because I had no idea as to the layout of the fortress, I was essentially walking around blind. Since I had a feeling that they were waiting for me to show up, I decided that it would be best to walk slowly, and perhaps do some sneak attacks of my own. I walked forward for a few paces until the cliffs opened up, and to my amazement and shock, the Garudoa's fortress stood before me. So that's the home of Ganondorf. I asked. 
You can already begin to imagine how he and his people have to endure living in such conditions like this, replied Spike. No wonder they have such disdain towards the other tribes because they have much better living arrangements. Still, you have to admit that this place is really intimidating what with those thick walls making it impenetrable apart from using all of those doors situated in various locations, and of course the guards on patrol make you feel uneasy because they could capture you at any moment. I said. Not all areas of the fortress will have guards patrolling them, said Spike. Then we need to find those places because that will make our exploration easier, I said. That's when I noticed a few of the Garudo walking near the top of the staircase, and I could see they were armed with spears which struck me as being odd. Then again, Spike did say that most of them were guards, so this was what I had to deal with for the most part. How many do you suppose are out here on patrol? Probably a few dozen of them, replied Spike. If I knock them unconscious, that will allow me to sneak by and in the front door, but wouldn't that alert the others to my presence? I asked. The night does obscure their vision, so they would need to be almost next to one another to be able to see anything suspicious, replied Spike. Going up the stairs would allow them to spot me instantly, so it would be best if we went around the long way. We might even find another entrance to use instead of the main one behind those boxes. I suggested. Spike nodded his head in approval, and I crept past the staircase and along the side of the cliff. There were some additional guards walking back and forth, but trying to sneak past was too risky as they were moving too fast. I needed to knock them out from a distance, and the only means was the ferry bow, so I took it out and aimed carefully. Any Mississippi fired arrows could alert them to my presence, so I had to hit everyone within mere seconds of one another. I'm glad that Iron Will taught me those pointers otherwise this would have been a disaster. The instant the guards were close to each other, I fired arrows which struck them both causing each to collapse to the ground. How long do you think they will stay knocked out? I asked. They'll be out for a couple of minutes, so we need to move quickly, replied Spike. Putting the fairy bow away, I rushed across the clearing, making sure that no one could see me, and I ended up reaching the side of the fortress where there was a second entrance. I could see some more guards in the distance, but they were too far away to notice what was going on so I walked inside where I found myself face to face with several spears aimed at me. About four Garudo were standing before me with their weapons at the ready, and the first thing that came to mind was to retreat back outside and find another way in. That's when I felt something sharp digging into my back, and behind me were several more guards including the two I knocked out a few moments ago. It looks like they were indeed waiting for me to show up and I have walked right into their trap. To be continued Chapter 52, The Shimmer Thief